Welcome to the Board Game Nights podcast, Game A Lot. We are your hosts. I'm Aos James. I'm Christoph Schrader. I'm Sam Gillespie. And I'm Jessica James. And we're coming to you live from, well, not really live, but from all parts of Australia, including Brisbane, where I am. I'm in Townsville with Aos, actually. Woo! And I'm all the way down in Canberra in the ACT. So truly, we are an Australian podcast through and through. Australia. Oh, we, we, do need to, we need to go to Western Australia, though. I feel like they're being left out. No. And, you know... We'll expand there eventually. Is that Australia? Expand there. <laughs> there is. The other half of Australia. W- what? Uh, anyway, so those uh, listeners who know who the Board Game Nights are, or who don't know who the Board Game Nights are, rather, um, we were reviewers on the Dice Tower until recently, uh, until a change of circumstances meant that we had to stop doing that. I had to move away to a different um, part of the country, so now we are doing a podcast for all of you listeners out there. In short, Sam moved. <laughs> 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 Sam 15 broke the hour nights. drive away, <laughs> by the way. Yeah, he, he is our Judas Iscariot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, someone's got to betray you guys eventually. Isn't that what nights are all about? I mean, how many nights so. have been betrayed? In, you know, well, anyway. Yep. Cool. So I guess we're wondering why we're doing a podcast now, right? I mean, we used to do reviews on the Dice Tower. That was awesome. It was good fun. We used to make videos, but, you know, we can't really be on the same place anymore. So I guess doing a podcast is suitable, isn't it, guys? We're going to try and make it more um, audience engaged in the future. But for this week, we're just going to talk about uh, some, some of the things of the past year and some of the things we're looking forward to in 2015. A retrospective of sorts. We like to meditate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Um, Tom Vassell. <laughs> Twenty fourteen in retrospect. Well, let's talk about some of the games that we tried for, for for the first time last year. So, because we're in Australia, we do sort of suffer from uh, time distortion. So, some of the games that are on this list probably came out in 2013, but we didn't get a chance to play it until only last year. We get a slow drip of games coming in. Yeah. In in Australia, you account for daylight savings by minusing six months. But, um... Yeah. So, the the first game that I want to talk about, personally, is one that I found to be an absolute hit with every group that I've played it with, and that's Concept. I just bought one. Yeah. Hmm. Concept was a Spiel des Jahres nomination. I think I pronounced that incorrectly. That is horrible pronunciation, thank you. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> it's, okay, just for pos- pos- prosperity of the title, it's Spiel des Jahres. Murdering things is ah. nothing new to us. Okay, thank you. Moving on. Concept. Uh, yeah, so Concept is um, was, was a nominee for that award. And um, <laughs> <laughs> the premise simply behind it is that you have a board that has every single sort of concept that you can think of, like person or food or animal or a colour or just a shape or things like that. And you have to try and explain something using these other concepts. So it's basically like trying to summarise the entire universe into some basic core concepts and trying to, try to scream at other people as they don't actually get what is the most obvious clue or sometimes yes. getting the correct one out of nowhere. It's, it's, it's really good fun. It's kind of like charades. Um, we played it a lot over the Christmas period, and that was like going to different meetings of different groups of people, people who don't normally play board games either. And we just got to play it and teach it instantly, and people got into it so quickly. You know, it was like a Swiss army knife of board games. How does it work with low numbers compared to high numbers? Um, we played it generally with like four people or up. Uh, we did play it once with three player, which was it still worked fine, but it's definitely one that scales very well w- with numbers. You can play it with a lot of people, you can play it with a few people. There's rules that yeah. allow you to have like two people putting down the clues, and um, so that it basically means that more people are involved. You get to do that more often if you're in a bigger group, or if you've got smaller mm-hmm. numbers, you just have one against everyone. There's one big thing that I actually say about the game is that it's got a scoring system that is kind of works contrary to the game, in my opinion. And so one of the big things I like to do is just to make it that it's not about points and just at, just play it until everyone's had a, had a few rounds and wants to have a break from it. I found that to be more enjoyable. It's like if you were playing Love Letter or One Night Ultimate Werewolf. You don't really count points in those games. Or Telestrations. <laughs> Most of the party games, yeah, including Telestrations. You just keep going until everyone's had their fill. No one's, no one's there to win. They're just there to have fun. Yeah, because mm. I find with, with Concept, it, it's very often that someone, like, picks up on the clue, says a word, and then someone else comes in and snipes the correct answer. And it's like, if you're scoring points for that, it's not fun when that happens, because you're just like, well, it was more like a collaborative thing, right? It's like scoring in a cooperative game aspect, it feels like, and it just doesn't doesn't seem to work, in my opinion. 
I just, I just found it a lot of fun. The idea that you're given a card with nine different concepts on it of varying difficulty and then having to pick one, that in itself was a little mini game. <laughs> I kept daring myself to pick the harder ones as we went on. Yeah, which we all promptly regretted. Yes. <laughs> but it was massively fun. I'm, I'm biased. I just bought a copy for myself. It's a great game. I've never had it flop, which says a lot for it. Indeed. Hey, else, what's your thoughts? Have you played it? Uh, yeah, I've played it. I, um, I'm not as enamored with um, most people, but I can see that it's a good game and that. But um, for me, yeah, it is has got similarities to charades because essentially trying to do the same thing. But it is a lot. It's much better than charades. Yes. And I, I think maybe it's just that I'm not very good at these games and um, <laughs> gives me a <laughs> bit of a um, negative bias on it. But I can see that uh, yeah, a lot of people did enjoy the game. Yeah, Th- that's concept. I would highly recommend it. Next on the list, I think is Star Realms, which I think Aos has played a lot. Uh, no, I haven't played a lot. I've played once, but I um I knew it was one that was very popular. So it was a small, uh, like it's almost like two decks of cards. I think as as it about that amount, and you it's a two player game. So you get a deck each. No, you you draw from the one deck. Totally wrong. And then you um <laughs> you lay them out in the middle, but you build your own deck from this central deck. It's a really good game. I was very impressed with it because it builds up from not very much at all. So a lot of deck builders, not so much Dominion. Dominion's got good accessibility, but it starts with a ten deck, so you need to have a a bit of a read through on this one. Uh, still, Star Realms come out. You've got your basic cards that you you start with, uh, and then there's five from the middle that you can choose from, and you've just got to read a bit of stuff on those but the way that all the combos works together is very simple and uh, the game advances from there so I don't know what this game is it's like a Mm. multiplayer deck builder Yes. So um, the, if you buy one set, you can have two players. If you buy a second set, you can have up to four. I okay, believe. cool. But I've only played the, the two-player one, but there's uh, just there's four different colors which represent four different types of cards. And then if you play one of those cards, you may activate another card of that type. So I think you draw five cards in your hand and you can play those five cards. Uh-huh. Um, and some of those cards, if they, they'll have an ability or something that they do, and then they'll have a secondary ability which may be comboed off another type of card. Of hmm. one of the other four types of cards. And if you can do that, you can sometimes draw more cards or get more money and get better things. It sounds like one of those games to me. Like, um, I love it when I play a game and there's lots of options, and then all of a sudden I start seeing these combinations and mm-hmm. that reward of after you play something and get all this stuff. It feels kind of like you've stumbled on something special, and that's really a nice experience in a game like that. Is it one of those sort of games where you sort of just go bam and you make this gigantic sort of thing? You sort of lay out 20 cards yeah, nearly. Yeah, Dominion, you know? Dominion was very much like that yeah you you can pull off some really good combos but generally you're you're building up a bit of a combo and then it gets taken down so you've got your base cards and you've got your ships that you play each round so you put a base card down and it'll have a certain rating like it may have a defense of six uh, and then you'll play a couple of your ships and they may have a total attack of four so you send four attack points over to your opponent and if they have a base that is above four then nothing happens however if they had a base that was uh three defense for example that would be destroyed and they would have to deal with that one extra attack point of which case they would take it off their health or or something of the type so they get 50 points each is uh, the game that we played so once you get through their defenses they lose that base card and then they take one point off their amount but it was a really nice tug of war of that and then um just with the four basic types of cards and the ones that come out in the middle it's really accessible you can look at it and go that works well and then as you keep going on the the bases can expand more cool well i i want to play it Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. (laughs) i should point out right now that it's actually quite interesting because there is a humble bundle for card games at the moment that's running and it probably will still be running when this comes out but probably not for much longer so if you're listening to this and this podcast just came out quickly go to humble bundle before it ends but they're right now selling star realms for a digital copy of it for pc and mac and android and apparently that's very good but if you pay 35 dollars in this bundle they'll actually ship you a copy of star realms and a t-shirt oh don't remind me nice i really want it (laughs) oh man humble just taking all of our money i know (laughs) so humble christmas was awful god all walks of life of gamers all walks of gamer life Mm -hmm. will appreciate that statement yeah (laughs) yeah So, yeah, so that was Star Realms. Cool. I think I should talk about this next one, because this is something I bought recently as well, and it's one of my favorite games at the moment. I'm teaching it to lots of people, and they seem to all enjoy it, including one particular person who doesn't play many board games. And this Ooh. game is called Ist- Istanbul. It was the Kennespiel des Jahres of last year, so the Critic Prize for 2014. Uh, very interesting game, lots of color. 
And the big thing about it that I like is that it's not a points collecting game, it's a race. Everyone is racing towards the same goal, and essentially who can get there first and figure out the best way will win the game, and I really like that. It looks like a very Euro game, not only by the cover art, but also by its description, you know what I mean? Well, it, it is. It's it's kind of like um, a Euro in the when, way that you're collecting resources and selling them off at... Mu- well, just to backtrack a little bit, Istanbul, the premise is that everyone is playing as a merchant and a group of assistants in the bazaar of Istanbul. They're collecting different uh, resources like uh, fabrics, fruit, spices, and jewels, and either selling them off to a sultan or selling them to make money at a market to get these rubies. The first person to get five rubies is the best merchant. They win the game. So it's a race to get those five rubies. And yeah, the best thing about the game, though, is the movement mechanic. So everyone has their merchant, a big disc on top of a stack of four mer- of assistants, right? <laughs> and then they move them around the board one, one or two spaces, and they have to leave behind an assistant to do the action. Oh. So the problem is that when you're moving around the board, which is modular, by the way, so awesome replay value, uh, you leave a person behind and therefore you've got less actions to do. So you have to find a circuit of actions around the board to make most use of your available assistance. So the puzzle itself is really different and really, I thought I found it really engaging and a lot of people that hadn't played board games before, I found they acclimatized to it very quickly too. So it had a good amount of meat to it for experienced gamers, but it was accessible as well. Yeah, I actually played it with, uh, with you, Christoph, um, about a month ago. And I remember um, it's really interesting because that whole mechanic of leaving your dudes behind, there's so many things inside the game to circumvent that that it actually doesn't even feel like a mechanic anymore. And you feel like really cl- clever and smart when you break the premise of the game. It just, it's, it's quite interesting in that respect that it's like every single tile that you end up on can be used. you just got to find the right time and the right place to use it and how to circumvent everything. And just, yeah, it's got some really good ideas. I, I quite enjoyed it. It. Was a, it was a very good example of having multiple parts the victory, but not having one path that was empirically better than the other. Mm. So everyone was playing very different strategies, yet we all ended up having four rubies and all chasing down that fifth ruby and being a turn away from you know being the mm. winner instead of someone else. Yeah. So I remember yeah. the first time I played it that I think I I beat I think Christoph you... by one point, yes. and then Christoph realized oh, yes. that there was a slight way that he could go to gain two points basically from me. So then he ended up winning the game, but it was like I was mm. hoping that he wouldn't notice. <laughs> in, t- in, t- in, in typical style, right, where if you occupy one space to do that action and if someone's already there, you've got to pay their merchant to do that action. So uh, the problem was for me that I could go to that tile and win the game, but then by paying that much money, I would then be behind Sam just by a tiny amount, so mm. I would have lost. And that last moment before I did that, I realized the police station was next door and I could send my family member to do it and thus not pay the fee. And, <laughs> and it was that Make magical of that moment what of what you will. <laughs> it's, it's such a cool game. I can definitely see why it got the Critic Prize for 2014. Mm. And like concept, it's in my fresh order coming across the seas right now. It left today. Like concept, how does it scale with players? Because it's two to five, technically. It's not probably not as good. I've I've played it with three, four, and five, mm-hmm. and they were all. I'd say they were pretty well balanced. I mean, with five players, the board gets very tight. Like there is a lot more competition for spaces because there's only sixteen tiles. That doesn't change based on the amount of players, mm-hmm. and therefore it gets more cluttered with five people. Mm-hmm. So you're going to end up paying more people to use spaces and compete over spaces. Whereas in a two-player game, of course, everyone can sort of do what they want and not clash too much. But I found that not to be a problem. That's so there's a, a variant right for a neutral player. Is that yes, to be yes. used with four and three players? Is that, that, right? that is that is the coolest thing. It is for four players and below. It can't be done with five because it basically uses the fifth player's tokens as the neutral piece. And what that allows is that players can pick up those tokens as their own. So it means that everyone starts the game with less of their own colour, but there's also the potential for them to have more total tokens. So you could have six actions and everyone else has got three if you're right. careful enough about it. And having those extra actions can be a huge advantage. So, Istanbul, we recommend? I definitely recommend it. All right, well, let's move on to the next one. We have Yunam. Yunam? Yes, Yunam. Uh, so Yunam's a game about um, running in your little workers out there, collecting a whole lot of tea and bringing it back and selling it so you want to get further and further into the mountains. Sounds like my kind of game. <laughs> tea! Woo! <laughs> I like tea. 
So at the moment, it's a very hard game to get a hold of. It, uh, it did have it available a while back, and then it became a bit hard to get a hold of. I only recently played it in the last week, but it's um, yeah, it's a very interesting game with um, the way the turn order wor- works. So there's a, an auction at the um, beginning of each round where you auction off for more people, uh, or you auction... So there's a whole heap of little auction tracks where you've got one where you want to get an extra person, you want to be able to move your people further. Uh, there's a privilege track which um, allows you to kick other people out of the way. Uh, you can get the donkey, I believe, which allows you to take your... You can move people into the further spaces. And then there's... Ah, what's the last one? Auction. Auction. <laughs> auction. <laughs> so there, you move your little people out. Um, and then the good thing about the auction is it's done in an interesting way. I think if you bid five, uh, you can be... If you're someone bids above you, you get kicked off that space. If you bid seven, you also get kicked off. However, if you bid nine, 12, or 15, you actually get it. So depending how much people want to bid on a certain thing, you might get something for really cheap. Um, the other you interesting run the part is that the... Yeah, exactly. You get kicked off and you can go back on, but you, knowing that you were first, you could have got it for nine as a definite. Uh, but if someone bids at 12, then you'll have to gonna, uh, go back for 15 to be able to get that. And money is pretty tight. It's one of the tight things in the game. And the people that you bid with on these tracks, you can bid on multiple tracks. And the more tracks you bid on, the less people you have to go out and get you more money for tea. So you <laughs> can win a whole lot of auctions for no money, but then you get no money coming in because you've got no people going out there. So you send your little people out there and um, each area, as it gets further along, generates more money. So the more workers on one area, so this first area gets you six or so. Question. Uh, do you have this game, Aos? No. Oh. No. Sounds like a really good one. No, no. Yeah, so it's quite it, tight. It, it is. It is. It is tight. Money is tight. That sounds good. So you you um you get your people to the to the first place. I think it gives you six points for that. Or you can set up a trading house. That's one of the other options. You put a trading house there, and that connects your link. So if you get a trading house, trading house, then a a worker and a worker, then you can get tea from that point and send it back. But if something nice. breaks the chain, then you can't send tea from that point. So if someone goes up there above you in the privilege track, they'll send you back a spot, and they can break your link. This is pleasing all of my euro inklings so to say but at the same time it's got that nice auction bit to it yes I like that spice I like auction yeah the, yeah. the auction is very good it sounds to me like a sort of game where if you just make a poor decision or if someone finds the right way to screw with you your entire plans can come crashing down like a house of cards yeah it, it can do so you can, if you want to set it up and take the gamble of not having trading houses by using a worker to form a link, you can also, on the map, you can form a bridge which shortcuts certain districts so that if you've got that bridge there, you can have a little shortcut and get the higher amount of money. Um, one of the interesting things is, though, the province or the, the area on the map that generates the most money, there's the... Uh, Oh, it's the like the regulations guy comes along to that area that generates the most money, and he's going to kick whoever is highest on the privilege track back to the start of the map. So they went one one of their people all the way back. Unless you unless you get all the way to level five privilege, he's going to do that to you. Or if you build a tea house in that province, you invite him into your tea house, and he'll kick the second most privileged person all the way back to the start. Wow, cool. In short, I want to play yeah. it. Yeah, sounds sounds interesting. I'd like to give it a go. So that was Yunnan, Y U N N A N. Because what, what is that word from? Is that is that like Chinese or Japanese? Or? I th- yeah, I assume it's for that particular area. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because I'm curious about like the theming of this game too. Like how, what it looks like is the the art for it. Because that's obviously going to set the theme. Because it sounds super Euro and it could be dry as anything, but that theme would add a lot to it. Uh, just from my memory of uh, obscure Chinese facts, Yunnan is a province of the People's Republic of China, located <laughs> in the far southwest of the country. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Is he read from Google?" <laughs> nice <Wikipedia>. recollection. <laughs> There's an amazing sense of uh, Google-like memory you have, Sam. Mm. It's, it's, it's just what I do. The next game we have is Five Tribes, and this one oh. was one that really, really captured my joy and love of board games. It's basically, if anyone's played the old old game of Mancala, it's a, you know, the, the traditional game Mancala, most people have probably tried it or played a variant of it or something like that. It's basically that on steroids. Mm. It's probably the it's best way amazing. to describe it. amazing. So the premise behind it's it is you have a five by six grid of tiles and each of those tiles have a different thing that they do. And they're each worth different points. And at the start of the game, you put three meeples of five different colours on the board. So at the very beginning, you look at this monstrosity of this huge board with with 90 meeples on it and all these different spots and go, 
oh dear, what am I doing? And then yes, a rainbow unicorn just threw up. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It is so colourful, but uh, just the first note I've got for this game is that it is so tactile, right? Mm. Yeah. You can, there's all these big wooden pieces, and you get to move them all around, and that's just... Oh, it's so good. Yeah. It is. Uh, this yeah. one was released by Days of Wonder, so it, it, it has all of that great charm and high-quality components that you come to expect from a Days of Wonder game. Um, but it's a Euro. But it's, 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 is it really, though? It is a bit of a Euro, I suppose. Let us not fall into the trap of labelling things specifically Euro or a merry trash. Okay, so the premise behind it is that you take a tile, you take all of the dudes up from that tile, and then you make a path from them, leaving one behind as you go along. And then when you get to the end, you get to do a special action depending on the colour dude you leave behind and the tile that, that's left. As the name suggests, there are five tribes or five different colours of meeple, which all have different actions associated with them. And those actions include getting parts of a set, which give you points if you get more of those th- more different types as you get along, or letting you t- get genies, or getting uh, builders to get... Jins. Jins. Jins, yes. Getting builders to get points, or getting um, viziers to try and have the most influence, I suppose. Assassins. Get or you can assassinate to kill dudes, you can try to take over mm-hmm. tiles. I, I love Five Tribes. It, it's in that same order of games I just bought, right? It's the same assembles in that order, concepts in that order, right? It's in that order, but I don't know if I'd like to compare them. Like They are similar in a way. Yeah, they're, they're both they're big, colourful, tactile games, but... They both have five an Arabic, Arabic <laughs> theme? <laughs> they, they, are, they are actually quite similar, but they both have different appeals, I think. Uh, Istanbul is a lighter game, I would say, but that's not to say that Five Tribes is meaty. It really isn't that hard. It was, it's qu- very accessible. I would put them on about the same level. They're pr- they're neither of them are particularly difficult to pick up. But they're very different kinds of puzzles. There's one thing that I really like about Five Tribes that I don't think you can say about Istanbul, and the one thing I'd hmm. like, like about it is that in Five Tribes, your early game doesn't matter as much as you'd think. Because at the, at the mm. start of the yeah. game, most of the moves are going to be pretty roughly yep. equal in value. And so if you're new to the game, you're not sit- sitting there going, oh, well, I've already screwed my first turn, yes. so I'm going to lose the game. Which, Correct. Which is true of a lot of Euros, Euro games, all those big media games where your early decisions can punish you later on. The case in point being I won my very first game of Five Tribes. Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Yeah. It's a very easy game, and as the game gets on, your decisions become focused because as you take dudes off the board, there's less and less moves available, so you can sort of try and channel and focus on what's important. But one of the really, really cool things about Five Tribes is that you start with 50 points, and you can bid those points (laughs) to determine turn order. So if you see a really, really good move, you can put in all your points to get the first player to get that action. But then you've spent all your points getting it that has actually sort of made it all cancel out in the end. So The auction is back in. Yeah. Auction. Auction. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no joke. That was the coolest part of the game. I remember when you were explaining it to me, every little piece you mentioned, like the meeple picking up, the movement, the five different types, that was all wonderful. But then the last thing you explained was the whole turn order. And I went, oh my god, that is so cool. <laughs> It is very cool. Because you could bid 18, was it 18 to yeah, secure 18. the top? Yep, but that's yeah. that's a lot of points because your points are literally your currency as mm. well. So it's, it's not really an auction, it's just purchasing a position. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Maybe someone may purchase a, a better position. And you, you get one chance. And even if you bid zero, then if someone else after you bid zero, they'll go before you. Yeah, yeah. so the first person to pass is going last. Yes, yes. correct. Uh, yeah, and so basically it means that you also have the advantage that if you're coming first, you'll probably come last unless you spend money. So it sort of always constantly shifts that player order if people aren't spending a lot of money on that. But if people spend a lot of money, then it's all going to be a bit chaotic and, and hectic. Yeah. And I've seen people win the game without spending a single coin, and I've seen people win the game spending most of their coins for turn order. Yeah. It just comes down to making the right purchase at the right time. It's really cool. In short, i got to say, it's very good value for money. It's a beautiful game, tactile, components yeah. are awesome. Yeah, that works and, nice. And it sells out, sells out so quick. Um, I got Mm -hmm. my copy from Cool Stuff Inc. and it was out of stock. Wow, Cool Stuff Inc. out of stock. That's rare. No, that happens. I I just noticed that's very rare. Compare it to what we normally have. (laughs) Compare it to Australia where I think we met a dude who was selling a board game once. Australia is the game boards... Game Game board games. (laughs) Australia is the board gaming Oliver Twist. He sits there with his little bowl and goes, please sir, (laughs) may I have some more? (laughs) But um, I gotta say, like Jess, you haven't played this I one have yet, have actually, you? Actually, but I you I have. didn't really understand the rules properly the first time round. Like an idiot, I sort of misunderstood something. Well, as soon as my copy arrives, we'll play it a lot. So I do recommend playing it more than once, especially because sometimes yeah. your first go is sort of a bit 
Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But definitely give it another crack because I know everyone else enjoyed it. <laughs> it's it's one of those games where after you finish your first playthrough, you're like, I want to play that again. Yeah. I've mm. got a strategy. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've you- um I've actually taught it more now than I've played it. I think I've played it, taught it probably about six, seven times and I've played it three or four mm. with the different numbers. And a lot of groups that I've taught it to have just gone and I come back and I'm like, wait, you're still going? And they're like, no, no, this is our second game. Mm. So it was amazingly quick. It. Yeah. And yeah. I love the first question they ask is like, oh yeah, five tribes. Yeah, we've got sp- uh, room for one more. I'm like, it's, it's a four-player game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're not actually a tribe. You're a, a tribe manipulator. Well, actually, that is the one thing that is a weakness for the game that, it, oh, if you can call it that, it is a Four player game, mm. so it, it works best with three or four, but the game does yep. start to fall apart with two players. I haven't played it with two players actually, so. Well, apparently, with the two player game, you start bidding for multiple positions in the bid. And so this you get two, mar- two pawns each oh. before everything refreshes. Correct, yeah. So you could essentially go first and second, or second and third, or third and fourth. Yes. Mm. So it, it's more restricted to a three or four player game specifically, which mm. is fine, just it's, you know. Well, maybe I recommend it for that, which is sometimes a bit yeah. difficult. Oh, if if that's the only thing negative I can say about it, that's that's awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, maybe I'll need to play a two player to see how it works. But yeah, it does sound a little bit fishy. But who knows? It could be good. Yeah, it's it's. I have played it with two player. It's nicer with three and four. Yeah. With that with that mechanic, essentially you could get four turns in a row. Yes. Mm, right. Yeah, that does seem a bit silly. All right. Well, that's five tribes. Would highly recommend that one. It's worth checking out at any rate. Buy it where you can. Yeah. Very good. The next one we have is sort of like the spiritual opposite of Five Tribes, and that's Eldritch Horror, which was the one that came out. It was either start of last year or early the year before, or late the year before, or something. Anyway, um, basically, everyone I think, oh, everyone knows that one guy that really likes Arkham Horror, and then they make the mistake of sitting down to play Arkham Horror with that guy, and then they get up four <laughs> hours later going, What did I just do? Because none of that seemed to matter or make any sense at all. Yeah. We were just reading a book about rules for 12 hours. Yeah, not to mention the fact that many people actually... It's, it's, a, it's a famous saying that you never, ever actually learn to play Arkham Horror correctly because you always get a rule wrong no matter what, no matter how many times Correct. you play it. Especially when you start adding expansions. What I really liked about Eldritch Horror was that it actually felt more like a Lovecraft game than Arkham because it just... You just got to feel that sort of despair that you're meant to feel in these sorts of games a lot quicker because everything suddenly starts failing on you, like, straight Mm. away. But you know what's going on. You know what's going on. You know what to do. You know what you have to do, but you just can't. Whereas with Arkham, you're just sort of flailing around, hoping that something finally works. Whereas Eldritch is like, no, I've got to do this. It's focused. You know what you have to do, and you can't. Which is what, which is where it comes, which is which is Lovecraft, right? It's the, it's about yes, the inevitability. It it's about the fact that you are just a pawn in a much greater scheme. And Eldritch is that game. It's a wonderful cooperative game, but as the first time we played it, I can't. What was the uh, the horror that we picked? It was Yog Yog Sagoth, or mm, I think it was, was um, it? Azathoth. Azathoth. Yes. Okay. So um, I mistakenly read the back of the card because that's what you do when you flip it over when <laughs> the haunting or what was it the you know the horrible thing happens, where basically the game becomes very hard to beat, near impossible. And with that one, it basically just ends the game immediately. But I remember looking at the art, and it just filled me with dread. It was the most horrible thing. The art is fantastic. Like, yeah. <laughs> the world gets devoured. The world gets devoured, yeah. and that's it. Yep, you will lose. Sorry. Yep. In comparison to Arkhamor, I found Eldritch to be a lot faster and a lot less time looking at rule books because when you needed to know a rule, it was usually put on the card that you were looking at. Yep. So if you were in prison, the card that says you are in prison outlines what to do when you're in prison, rather than having to find the rule. Oh, that sounds nice. Yeah. Flip this card over. You sound like you haven't played Eldritch, have you? No, I have not played. Have this you one. played Arkham though? Uh, yes. So we kn- we have a contrast here. <laughs> so you know the horrors of Arkham Horror. Pun intended. <laughs> so that's a yes. Yes. Okay. Play Eldritch. It's a much nicer experience. Yeah. yeah. So that's like if if someone were to go out and wanting to buy like if they love Lovecraft and like board games, good combination. They want to go buy a game that suits that theme. Uh, if you're looking at Eldritch or Arkham, definitely go for Eldritch. Well, let yeah. me start. Yeah. There, I'd imagine. Start with Eldritch. Yeah. Because yeah. that. Yeah, I think Arkham Horror goes uh, depending if it's the base game and the 50,000 expansions or not uh, it's two to four hours right or two two, two question mark hours yeah uh, two is being yeah, I, I, yeah. I think like with Arkham Horror yeah maybe if you've played the game enough times that you know most of the rules that you don't need to consult it yeah you can probably squeeze in like a three two or three hour game 
Whereas Eldritch is a two or three hour game. It's yeah. just flat. That's right. what it is. Because you don't have yes. to consult all the rules. Once you've got the basic mechanics of the game down, it just flows. Yeah. And, you and just that's even that's even with six or seven people too. The other thing is, is that yeah, because yeah. you've got more things that are sort of in your pile, it becomes like, I think Arkham sort of falls into the mistake of one person or two people are sort of commanding what everyone else is going to do. Whereas Eldritch mm. is sort mm. of commanding your own sort of section and you go, oh yeah, by the way guys, I have this ability. I can go do this. You know, you feel like more of a single person in a group rather than commanding over a group of people with another group of people, if that makes sense. It's important to emphasize that it was a cooperative game and it really made good use of cooperative. Like everyone everyone has a very specific character, mm -hmm. very good flavor, but then they have a very specific action and you know for a fact that this person is going to be good at that. So your person will be good at being at sea, your person's going to be good at destroying monsters, yours is going to be good at finding clues. That's awesome and it encourages you to mix those together as best as possible and you all work together mm -hmm. on this immense project. Yeah. And that's the game. I think there's a lot of replayability in in the box because there's there's four big evil bad guys to beat, including yeah. our old friends Cthulhu and all that. But each of them also have side adventures that you can go on to get nicer things or or stuff like that. You've so also lots... got like more characters to play as as well, and I'm sure doesn't it have a difficulty? I can't remember if it did have a harder or easier difficulty. The different um, ancients do have a different difficulty. So like as a yeah, boss. Is is if yeah if you if you go too slowly you instantly lose the game but he gives you a much greater window to play the game whereas something like Cthulhu is really hard straight from the straight from yeah, the start. A good way mm. to see it is they're like separate campaigns. They all have a separate difficulty. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, cool. um, that's Elder Chara. I would highly recommend checking that one out if you look if you're looking for a nice cooperative game, a nice cooperative game about everyone dying. Yeah. Well, it, hey, it fits a big group of people anywhere between three and eight, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I would probably maybe be hesitant to play it with seven or eight unless you were really into the game, just because it might. But it drag can do that. But it can do that. You can actually which also is play important. You can play it single player. I did that yes. to learn the game, which is a nice little thing to have an option but I wouldn't really play it single player that much but it can do it which is important yeah it's recommended alright and uh, the next one we have on the list is Patch History I haven't played this oh, one. Oh yes um, <laughs> Aos and I are the only ones who have played this game so let's have a little discussion about how you want to now play Patch History Sam Lovely. and Jess <laughs> so I'll just have a nap then Oh, no. Again. Okay, so Patch History. No. Uh, we're talking about Patch History, which is a civilization game, so civilization building. So it's generally those are very big, long games, boring for some. Uh, however, for us, we like to play those sort of games, and it turns out that Patch History fits the bill pretty well, but also makes it nice and streamlined. Yeah, it would be the best of these games, Easily. in my opinion. Easily. So my experience prior to Patch History was a game called Through the Ages, uh, Vlada Shvatel fame. Really nice civilization building game however it took a very long time to play and by the end of it it was quite exhausting like it, it was a very taxing game for me to play and I've played Twilight Imperium <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, okay so, so Pat that one took us about four, four, four to five hours right uh, the Three of the Ages? Yes. Uh, five. I think it was a good five, yeah. Patch History, on the other hand, was about three? Well, I, I first, the first game that um, I had played with the learning took about four, and then after that, most games had been three. But it was a very a exhausting three or four hours, was it not? Yeah, th there's a lot of things in there, yeah. Yeah. Patch History, on the other hand, uh, makes... Like, the way it's streamlined in its presentation, it's you've got everything in front of you, all of your statistics, all of your numbers. It's very easy to follow. It's very easy to see what everyone else has. But the coolest thing about Patch History is in the title, and that is the patchworking mechanic in the game. You, you literally start with this little board which has different colored patches that represent different resources or income, and then every round you're auctioning... There's that auction again. Auction. Auction. <laughs> you're, you're auctioning for different tiles, mm. which then you literally patch over the top of your little play mat. Or under. Or under. So as this game goes on, you are making this unique quilt work of income and like statues and buildings and it's ah oh, it's so just that part is so cool and it's very hard to explain in words but it's what makes the game different easily like what did you think of it yeah i i exactly the the same sentiments what i really like is the you so you've got a shield which hides all of your resources and goods that you generate each round in front of that you'll have a um 
I don't know, uh, you've got two little zones with uh, multicolored markers. So you've got eight eight markers, four on this one, four on this one, and then you can look at a glance at either yours or any other players and you can see what they're generating and where they're up to. So they've got a military strength of five, for example. They've got a defensive total of seven. They uh, generate $3 each round. Uh, so you can look at their weak points and their strong points from yeah. that. You can see what everyone's uh, attributes are as a civilization. Mm. However, you cannot see at that time what they have in hand. That's yeah. all secret information. Yeah, that's right. So all of the resources that they generate, which is uh, money, victory points, food, and resource cubes. Yeah. So the good thing about patch history, though, is it allows uh, you to be you know, a military power. They can have that player interaction of direct combat, or you can choose to be nice and have a direct trade route with your neighbors. So it plays on that whole civilization idea very nicely, but in, a, again, a very streamlined way, and that was the thing I liked about it the most. So we sat down and learned it very quickly. We played it, and it just felt smooth. There was yep. no lagging or long play going on. It was just a very good experience, yep. which for a Civ game is very hard to accomplish. Yes, yeah, so there's a little chart there with um, that takes you through all the steps. You go in, uh, everyone starts uh, with the beginning, a little bit of money, uh, a little bit of a patching and their boards, um, and they start at various levels, and you've got some workers. So your workers can generate extra abilities on some of the uh, patches, or they can go to a trade route and get more goods. So you, you would go to a trade route to go and visit your neighbour, and you can negotiate with them uh, in a peaceful way or an aggressive way. So you can start a war, or you can um, come to an alliance and possibly set up an allied trade route and start generating some victory points, or go and attack them. There is a problem, however. Uh, this game is a Korean game, is it not? Yes, okay. yes. And it is currently being... I don't know how it is, how far in the translation or availability. It's not widely available as of yet, is it? No, it's, it's much better now. Stunt Guide have, have re-released it, and then there's a second edition of the rule books, which I would recommend. I think the original Korean one had the English rules, but they were very hard to follow, so the new ones have updates, and uh, Board Game Geek clarifications really help. Mm, they were on the level of Power Grid, were they not? Yeah, <laughs> yeah there, there's quite a few rules in it, and there's a couple that you'll probably miss on the first time, and... Um, yeah, even playing a couple of rules wrong, as I know we did. Still a very <laughs> enjoyable game. Indeed. So, Sam, Jess, does that sound like a game you want to play? Yeah, I'll definitely give that one a go. It sounds yeah. um, like a, a nice, solid civilization game, which there doesn't seem to be too many in that sort of spectrum that like really fit that, that, that nice length to detail to good decision-making. It's, it's hard to get that balance right. It was just the idea that it had that decision making. It was streamlined. You could fit a four player game in about three hours, and then it had that awesome me mechanic, which is really unique to it. And that's what separated it from the rest of them. Well, it's just interesting. So you, uh, more patches come out. So you'll have little patches that you can put into your thing. You go through three ages. You can only patch five by five on the first age. They're six by six, seven by seven. So you're patching this stuff in. Um, and if you don't win the one you want in an auction um, and it doesn't fit into your uh, civilization patch, you yep, just go throw that away. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like terraforming a little civilization piece yes. by piece. And that's just, it's awesome. It's, there's no other word to describe it. So we certainly have to play that next time we're all together mm. in a group definitely and we will re we will report back because I think that's a special game to talk about it's it's a highlight what do you from last year what do you think of that Jess yeah no it sounds good I definitely need to play it to be able to get a real I suppose go of it but yeah no it sounds good I saw the art of it and I was like oh that looks good but I was like uh, uh, you can uh. have your very own Genghis Khan or Mahatma Gandhi yeah or the pyramids of the, course the pyramids of Giza yeah yeah they're all good do cool. they each have like special powers for each of the different people like Types, All of the yeah. heroes, yeah. When you get a hero... Um, so, of the patches, this each patch side... So, there's a deck for the first age... And on one side, they've got uh, all the resources. So they've got little buildings on there, which will either generate coin, military strength, and so forth, just with icons. On the flip side of that is the, uh, the black side, and that will either be wonders or heroes. And they'll all give you a special ability, and they'll also increase a particular uh, thing. So the wonders are different, and the heroes are different from each other. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, if you're playing a four-player game, you'll have two white sides of an age yep. in the auction and two black sides, and then people will auction for those particular tiles. So you either going to get Hero and Wonder or you're going to get some general buildings mm -hmm. or, or special buildings is some of the other ones that boost all of those things. So you can combo. It is a risk and reward of sorts where you're trying to you know, make the most efficient use of your patching. However, you really want to go for those nice big heroes as well because they give you such a massive boost that only you can have, but they do take up a lot of space on your patchwork and thus limit you and your future choices. Yeah. So you've got to balance that risk and reward, but that's a really good puzzle and that's what makes the game good. Nice. Sounds good. So patch history, that's one to look out for.
Yeah, it certainly is. Yep, I want to play more of it. All right. Super Rhino. So Super Rhino is a cute little kids game for kids only. Like me. <laughs> and Aos is the only one here who has played this game? Yeah, just recently. I don't think it had come out too long ago. Um, I think it's only just come out in the last couple of months. Uh, so it's a harbour game in a small yellow box. Oh, you've played Oh, no, no, no. I just saw that it got honours for the 2012 Spiel des Jahres. Spiel des Jahres. Wow, yeah. so this is possibly quite an old game. Yeah. <laughs> How about... Sorry, well, okay, I'm just going to put it in. Board, board uh, games are without time. They are they endless. Are. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently it's 2011, so it's, it's, it's a little bit... Well, this is new for Aos, and he's going to tell us about <laughs> yeah. it. You got to play this at CanCon, correct? Uh, yeah, just before CanCon. So there's um, pretty much uh, two decks of cards. You've got... Uh, f- so there's a super rhino that you have, which is pretty much just a little meeple in the shape of a rhino, oh. because rhinos are super. Cool. Um, and they crush, kill, and destroy things, <laughs> which is like the building, three-dimensional building that you're creating. So you've got... Sounds like Rampage. Yeah, it, in a way it is similar, but you're trying to build something up without it falling over. So oh, you've got yeah. uh, two decks of cards, and one deck of cards is the floor. And so you place a floor card, and it'll have a little uh, template on there. All of the other cards have got a crease along the center, and you fold them at 90 degrees. They're your wall cards. So oh, they're designed to be folded. I know, but that's like ink and gold, and that's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you put a floor tile down, and then it will say on there, it's got a special... Some of them have special abilities as you get along further. So you put down your little wall tiles. Um, to suit in those positions and then you put a floor on top and whatever that floor says it'll do special abilities like you may have to move the rhino up to that new floor and uh, yeah just keep going and see how high you can get it without making the whole thing tumble to the ground it, so- it sounds like a nice simple dexterity game yes yeah yep. it's really fun cool awesome well it we're all going to have to play that one then yeah sounds nice and yes. easy are you yeah, get- very, are very you- simple are you getting a copy for yourself yes I am cool then we'll so be playing then, that then we will the play it too. oh awesome all Does right. it have a limit to number of players at all? Uh, I'm not sure what the limit is, but yeah, we only played with two, so we didn't exactly use all of the powers and that, so I haven't really played the full game, but yeah, trying to make it as high as we could was very fun. Cool. Excellent. All right. Uh, the last game that we have in this section is uh, probably the game that I have played the most out of any board game ever at this point, <laughs> just, because, yeah. just because of how easy it is to get to the table, how quick it is to run a game, how easy it is to teach with everyone, and how everyone gets the game pretty much immediately. And that is, of course, One Night Ultimate Werewolf. Now, yes, we have, yes, we have all played this game. A lot of us own this game, and we all like this game. And notably, it is a version of a game that has many different versions, okay? Yeah. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, like, uh, I think we've all played a, a game of Werewolf, which is, which is basically the game... The game One Night Ultimate Werewolf is based on regular Werewolf, which is a game that I find that can be often a little bit slow, but dependent on the right group that you have, dependent mm. on the cards that you use. It's a very subjective experience, and it creates a sort of... It's, it's more about trying to tell a good story, but in doing so, you end up with, like, I don't know... 70% of the games you play just not being that interesting and or just, you know, ending too soon or nothing really happens or the lies are pretty straightforward yeah. or the lies are so good that there was no way you would ever catch them so it always feels a little bit like, oh, well, that was a kind of a waste of time. Mm. Um, whereas I think One Night Ultimate Werewolf gets around that because the premise behind the game is everyone gets a role at the start and each of those roles can be anything from just a being a regular villager to being a person that can see the future as a seer or you might even be a werewolf. And everyone will wake up in their own sort of section, everyone has a section when they wake up, and does a special action. And some people allow you to swap characters between other players, some allow you to get to see some of the roles. Um, And then what happens is everyone will wake up, and then at that point you can't see who you are. So if you've been swapped to someone else, you need to derive that from the other players. So straight away, the werewolves have a reason to talk to people and to, to find out who everyone is, because at the end of that round, everyone will choose a person to die, and if that person's a werewolf then the werewolves lose and the villagers win. So so you have it that everyone has an incentive to add information because the werewolves want to find out if they're still a werewolf so that they can li- then lie or they might want to lie straight up. Or, b- But the thing is there's a countdown timer so the game always ends in like 10 minutes and then at the end of that you'll say, well, that was a good game, let's play it again because it was so quick. 
the, fu- the funniest, funniest thing about that game is that when a werewolf, knowing they're a werewolf, <laughs> finds out that they were swapped. Yeah. Because <laughs> it and was like, wow. And, and then they no longer lie about not being a werewolf. And then they rat out the fellow, the person who's now a werewolf because they're happy that they're no longer a werewolf. It, it's, it's just a very neat deduction game. Yeah. Hidden roles deduction. It's also good to note that there are three cards in the centre, so you don't know where that if, if all the roles mm. are even out there. We did have one game where both werewolves were in the middle and we're all trying to kill each other. So. And conversely, <laughs> yeah. conversely everyone still thinks when, everyone's lying. It's great. Yeah, yeah. And con- conversely, when you have a doppelganger and all of a sudden werewolves wake up, oh, werewolves wake up. <laughs> <laughs> awesome app for it, by the way, by um, the voicing sound by Eric Summerer. Yep. And it's a little mobile app you can get that's free, and it will basically run the game for you, so one of you doesn't have to run the game yourself, which is very handy. So yep. it goes, werewolves, wake up. And if there's a doppelganger werewolf, all of a sudden three people open their eyes, and there's that <laughs> moment of confusion where they look around the table and go, oh, there's three of us. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just madness. Put it, put it this way, this game is so great that I took it to work one day, and I haven't been able to get it home, because every time I've tried to take it, people are playing it. So you donated it. Uh, uh, <laughs> unwillingly, yes. <laughs> but that's good. Isn't, yeah. isn't, that, isn't that what this hobby is all about? Absolutely. Sharing it with people and enjoying it? Absolutely. Yeah, this, it's in, very good. this is the ultimate gateway game to get people into board games because you can be anyone and you can get this game. There's nothing hard about it. And 99% of the game is just how you talk to other people and how you discuss and and you're playing with other people. There's, there's yeah, it's all about um, the the memories. We we I played with a um an eight or nine year old, uh, one of our friends' Aww. daughters, and um, she did just extremely well. And at the end of it, we like looked at her and like, why did you lie about that? And she's like, I just wanted to fool you all. <laughs> <laughs> it was gold. We're just like, oh, we totally got the game, and that that was a memory. Yeah, never forget. There's Jess's trademark cackle. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. great. It's, yeah. it's an evil game for evil people, but it's a lot of fun. I remember yeah. when we played yeah. a four-player version of it, and oh my god, that was intense. Yeah, it, because it there was that very moment. Well. There was that moment of realizing where you guys all realized that you outnumbered me. There was more werewolves than villagers, <laughs> and I was like, "Well, well, I'm burned." Yeah. <laughs> So. But not necessarily. If you're a good liar or there's a tanner in play, then you can escape. Oh, of course. Of course. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah th- it scales really well. Yeah. It's just, um, if, if anyone is looking for a party game or something, it's small, it's cheap, and you can play with quick anyone very quick. Rounds are about five or ten minutes at most. And you can teach it very easily anywhere between three and ten people. It's, it's, it's a silver bullet, you know? It's a very good game for any collection. Hmm. Yeah, it is. It's it's very easy to get into. It does scale fairly well. Fairly well with yeah. the numbers, and uh, yeah, there's depth and complexity there if you want it. But I think it's more of an experience game. It's not really mm. one that you want to even bother with the scores at the end. Like you know who won, and you're like, that's cool and all. But yeah, the the memory of it, you're just like, I remember when you did this. Yeah. Any, any game that has players screaming at each other at the end of it, going, "How could you lie to me? How did you fool me?" Oh, uh, you know, it's never a silent affair when the final round happens. It's never just, "Yes, that was a good game." No, it's always, "No," or something like that. It's 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 brilliant. I would highly recommend this one to anyone. You'll always find an opportunity to play it. Great way to round out a night after a big, long, tough game of patch history. Just finish with one night ultimate werewolf. You'll have a great time, no matter what. Cool, excellent. And now for something completely different. Okay, and uh, this is our overview of the upcoming games from 2015 that we are looking forward to. So some of these games probably come out in 2014, but they will be more widely available in, in 2015, and any new ones that are coming out in 2015 that have not yet made it. No doubt we'll have a bunch of games at the end of the year that we don't even know of yet that, that we'll end up liking, but this is just where we are right now, a sort of snapshot of what we're looking forward to. And there is many. <laughs> just, just a reminder, Especially we're Australians, we miss out on Australians. And yeah, moving on. Miss out on a to, few. to link up the last one, last one we sort of wrapped up with One Night Ultimate Werewolf. Uh, so the next one yep. we'll start with uh, Daybreak, the expansion towards it. Now, like I've played probably hundreds of games of One Night by this point, maybe a hundred or so. Uh, How many? That, exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. So many. Tell me. But um, okay. All right. <laughs> some of the roles, <laughs> some of the roles for it do get a little bit stale now, and it's sort of like it starts to become a little bit samey. So Daybreak <laughs> is coming out with. Heaps of new roles of of all sorts mm. of different nonsense that you can add to your games, and 
Uh, anything that adds more customization to an already solid game is is a big tick in my box. It's an expansion, like in the truest sense. Like it's it's adding a bunch more roles and making them better. In that there's more types of werewolves added to the game. They link in together. So you know the ones in the new one, in the new expansion, will actually link into each other. So doing combinations of them will actually make them more powerful together, which is interesting. I think it's also a stand a standalone game, right? But I can't imagine that it would be over balanced like I think in the original that they really nailed some of the roles that you would really want to have in it right you always play with them um, like the robber and the seer and the troublemaker and the base just because it's the solid of the game there's always something that's gonna do something that'll mess things up there's mm. always gonna be that and you know it's always gonna be there so it actually adds the game so without that I don't know I feel like it could just get a little bit too unpredictable or it'll be a little bit too predictable I don't think there's that nice balance of having just the solid core and then you add roles to sort of mess with that core um, so, yes, it is a standalone, but I have a feeling it probably shouldn't be, if that makes sense. I would, without playing it, uh, that's how it seems to me. I'm going to treat it as an expansion. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and apparently it's also got a whole new app for it with, um, with a female um, voice. In- oh, really? Instead it's of it's already been updated. Yeah, um, uh, it's got Ashley Birch, I think, from um, uh, Borderlands. I think she's a voice actor from Borderlands. Uh, but Ashley Birch. Oh, wow. Um, so yeah, it's it's um uh, it's and it's got different options as to who does what voice. So you can have all the old characters done by Eric Summer and all the new ones done by Ashley, or you can have all the female ones done by Ashley and all the all all the males done by Eric or stuff like that. It's the, it's the nice little things, right? I like some of the roles, like the village Elliot idiot. It's awesome. I think Sorry. the village. <laughs> okay, the village idiot is everyone rotates around by one. It is silly. It is it is nonsense and. I kind of want to give it a go, but I think it's going to be pretty terrible. It sounds broken. <laughs> but hey, maybe it's fine. But I, I'm excited to, to give it all a go. I'm, I'm looking forward to that one quite intensely. Well, I, th- I think it sounds pretty good, actually. Because like, if there isn't a village idiot, like actually one of the players, and they say, look, I'm the village idiot and I did this, <laughs> once they know that the person to that particular side was not a werewolf, and then that would clear their name if they were believed. Yeah. So, or conversely, and create a new werewolf. Exactly. I think it's more of a logistical issue that if you have eight players, them rotating eight players around isn't going to be... <laughs> yeah. Anyway. In in short, there's also a really nice uh, like tonal shift in the aesthetic of the game. Like it, It's called Daybreak, right? So the, you look at the colour and the art for it. It's a lot brighter and more colourful. And the original One Night's like really dark, right? And I noticed that immediately with Daybreak that all of the all of the new roles they got a lot of color to them, and there's just a lot more brightness in everything. And a lot of the actions are to do with the day phase as well. And that player mat, that's that's what I'm down for. I can't wait for that to turn up. That looks awesome. Well, we always play with a player mat or a, or a blanket in the middle just to stop that noise. Anyway, well, we do. All right, so that's Daybreak. Um, the next one we have on our list is XCOM, the board game. Now, has anyone here actually played XCOM? No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Great. Take it away, Sam. <laughs> you are all terrible people. No, XCOM... So, XCOM was a classic um, video game from the 90s, and it was one of these uh, big sort of build up a base, um, l- long-term, f- sort of like a 4X game where you're just trying to build up and slowly slowly stop this massive alien force coming down. So, you play as XCOM, which is a... Um, uh, an intergovernment agency, which is all about trying to fight aliens, so you get funding from all over the world, but you've got to look after the world because if parts of it start dropping off, you get less money, which means that you get less powers to, to fight the aliens, and it becomes this like big, long, epic struggle. They recently rem- remade it about two years ago, I think, um, so Sid Meier, who makes a lot of those civilization games, uh, um, video games, made, the, uh, made a new remake of it, and it was very popular, it was very good, very well-designed game, and um, so Fantasy Flight were then commissioned to make a board game version of it, and this is actually uh, quite an interesting one because it actually has an app for it. So you need to actually have an iPad or, or a phone somewhere handy that actually show that actually outlines what's actually happening at each stage and that randomizes a lot of the game so that you can always have a new experience every time you try it. That's good to hear because I like the idea of uh, game companies and publishers starting to incorporate, like One Night, right, a good example of the app, but incorporating extra media to make their games have that next level of interaction. You know, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. It might be a negative if it's exclusive or it has to have it, but it's just a cool idea of expanding further, further than like, you know, board, uh, cardboard and chits and tokens. Well, I have no issue with it being, um, you know, a necessary component of a game. I mean, obviously it's going to suck if you don't have one of those um, devices. I mean, that is that is a big issue, right? You're going to cut out a, a percentage of the market that just want a nice old-fashioned board game. But I think the biggest potential issue that it would be is about support for those... Um 
those mobile apps because a lot of the time, because I, I now work at a mobile games company, we have to spend a lot of time updating games as new f new um, uh, devices come out. And it's just a, a case of hopefully Fantasy Flight will continue to maintain support for this uh, for this little app. I mean, it doesn't have to be complicated, but if it, and I need to make sure that it, it'll be around forever because it would really suck to have a great board game that you can't bring out because you don't have an old iPad from five, ten years ago. Um, I'm sure you can trust Fantasy Flight Games. They're a wonderful publisher. Well, yeah, but you don't know where they're going to be in ten years, right? Oh, I think I think they're on the up. I can imagine, like, second versions of these games and things like that coming out nearly to replace it, and then you'd end up having to download another game, so therefore you've got, like, another influx of customers. Yeah. And, yeah, and it's like, like it help. Twilight Imperium, Fantasy Flight's, uh, you know, their main epic game has mm. a third edition now. And every time a new edition comes out, there's the, the old guard that bring in new players, or new players come in and find it. So it is constantly updating every generation or so. I can imagine if we started getting hologram boards or tables that had electronics <laughs> placed into them, oh, then you day. would basically have a... Yeah, exactly. So you'd start having new games like that. My I, dreams. I, I guess just my issue is that maybe if they release an XCOM 2nd edition that might not be compatible with the 1st edition, then they might have difficulty with the app. I'm just, I'm just you know, mm. I'm, I'm excited for it. I would love to see it. I would love to give this one a go. This is one I've been looking forward to for a while and haven't ever had a chance to play it. Everyone who's played it says it's interesting and cool and, and unique and, and fantastic. I'm the, it's just a small concern I have that I hope that they address because if it creates a problem, then we'll never see it again, right? If, if mm -hmm. Fancy Flight screw this up, we will never see a nice implementation of electronic and board media, which I think is it, it's, a, it's a great new yeah. design space to explore. Yeah, it's, it sounds like an important game that it's going to be a, a new test of sorts for that sort of thing to happen. If it goes well, then you might start seeing more of it implemented in other games. Yeah, well, we've got a lot of helping apps, but it'd be interesting to have one that's 100% uh, needed in a game, which I think this is the, the first one. Uh, that is needed specifically to play the board game. Well, th there were all that that huge influx of old board games that required you to have a DVD and one and stuff stuff like that, which were very gimmicky and very silly way back in the day. Which I think we are all a little bit glad that we've moved away from. Um, yeah, but is anyone crying about it today because they don't have a VCR to play these particular games? That's a fair point. Not so much. <laughs> That's a fair point. So, and then there's these people today that are going, oh no, what if this happens? What if that happens? And I think that uh, for it, at least Apple, I'd say that this particular app should be available for quite some time. And if not, they may port it over to the PC and have it something a little bit more consistently available as well. True. And there's always, you know, huge modding communities with everything that, that comes along with this sort of stuff that someone will be able to preserve it, right? Someone will sit down, grab the source code, and just turn it into a PC version of it so everyone can play it. So it'll be around so. forever. Mm. Um, I just hope that Fantasy Flight put in the extra effort to make sure compatibility and everything all works quite well, which it should. It should be fine. Cool. All right. Very good. All right. So next one is Spyfall. Who wants to take this one away? Oh, I'm going to start on Spyfall. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, been, I've been waiting for this. I've been waiting for this. Okay, um, EOS introduced me to Spyfall. Uh, one game night, we had a lot of people. It was a very large game night, larger than intended, most likely. So we had to break out some party games, right? It limited the... Yeah, 10 people, I say? Yeah, okay. It limited the amount of games I could play, and EOS decided to bring out Spyfall. Now, Spyfall is a Russian design game, yep, and it's not currently available uh, in English, so it's a print-and-play at the moment widely distributed print and play on board GameGeek, but it is a hidden roles game similar to One Night as before, but the idea that there is a situation where everyone on the table is a spy, oh sorry, is a, is a <laughs> character of some variety, and one of them no, is a no, spy. No, no, no. I, um, That's what I a spy would say. Yeah, <laughs> but the trick, of, the trick of it is that the spy has to remain anonymous, that is what their goal is, and everyone else is trying to find out who the spy is in the round. So... It's got this interesting dynamic of everyone asking a question one at a time. Just to backpedal a bit, um, so everyone is given a location, uh, and one person is given a spy card. And so that location could be anything from a beach, or a police station, or uh, a pirate ship, or something like that. And th everyone knows where they are except for the spy. Yes, and the spy has to be very careful when they are asked a question, <laughs> that they answer correctly. So everyone will ask questions to each other to try and work out who the spy is, and the idea is that they try to ask a question to the spy that will reveal whether or not they know where they are. And if they don't know where they are, everyone's going to be like, you're the spy, and the spy loses. But if the spy works out where they are, they win the game. Yes. Correct. It is a very interesting game. Like, we played it in two groups of five, and we played it like that for like 
two hours or something. We played a lot of it. <laughs> it was so good. I don't really know how to describe it either, just the, the whole tension of that game. There is a time limit for each round, and it's not like a questions are asked randomly all about. It's one person asks a question to another player, and then that player has a turn to ask a question, and it cannot be back and forth between two players. That's it. The good thing about it is it's not round robin, so you don't just keep going directly around the board. If someone is suspicious, then multiple players can come back to that one mm. to expose them. And plus, it's also good when the spy has to ask a question about it. If that question looks really <laughs> suspicious, then people then start... It's, <laughs> then it's game over. It's really hard to be a spy in the game, uh, right. but it's so I, rewarding. I, I was just wondering, because I haven't, I haven't played this one yet, um, but it looks like a really good game, but how would you compare it, say, to One Night? Very different. It's yeah, very, very different. Same. I would say it's yep. a completely different experience. I would say that they're, they're completely different to each other, and there's room for both. It fits, mm-hmm. in, it fits in the space of a multi-person party game deduction type thing, right? But the actual games themselves are vastly different, right? I'll give you a case study where Sam completely blew it out of the water for me, where he was the very first person to ask a question, right? So he was the person who won the previous round, thus gets to start the next round. Uh, he made his first question. Everyone looks their cards and nods accordingly to show they know where they are and he immediately asks what is the colour on the right side of the card (laughs) yeah that was just me being a bit of a (laughs) yeah that was very clever of you and so obviously everyone who has a card knows the answer and the spy doesn't (laughs) so obviously a game breaking question yeah but but it was was clever We all worried about it for a few minutes, and then I realised that for Sam to even ask that question, he could very well have been the spy. He just asked the question. He didn't have to know the answer. Uh. He could have just asked the question, and I was like, wait, you're the spy. (laughs) He wasn't wasn't in the end. It just turns out I met at the meta. But, you know, it was just that moment of sheer terror. And that's the tension of the game that was really interesting. Like, it was kind of stressful, Mm. but it was fun. Like, so much fun. It's, it's really good. It's it's a hard game when you're the spy, and it's also a hard game when you're not the spy, because, you know, people's answers are just very, you know, yes or no, and they don't really give anything away. It is terrible when you are the spy, and it's the first question. <laughs> the, the best case, best best, the funniest one that happened was, I was the spy, and I had no idea where we were or what was going on, so I asked the question, would money exchange hands in this location? Just trying yeah. to be, cover all bases, right? Like, um, uh, just, just sort of see how it goes. Everyone immediately looked at me as if I was, like, the worst person imaginable. Because the location was a police station. <laughs> because it, it made it sound as if you were knowledge, you had the knowledge of the location. But it was kind of vague enough. People thought I was being, like, really dark and ironic or something like that. And I just had no idea where we were. But the funny part is if, like, if everyone around the table, because there's everyone but one, knows the location. If they all have a sa- similar reaction, like a laugh or a... That can't be true. Or then the person who's the spy is trying to catch on and repeat <laughs> that same exclamation. <laughs> like everyone starts laughing, the spy's like nervous laughter. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's funny. Uh, 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 don't kill me. <laughs> it, it's brilliant. So I'm uh, just in short. When this comes out in English translation, I'm definitely getting a copy because it's a cool game. The artwork on the English uh, copy is absolutely beautiful too. There's a little spy in there. It's all cartoony. It seems uh, very well done. I I can't wait for that. There's you know a lot of situations in the game too. So sometimes there'll be certain people that won't like this game that can't think of a question or you know it's if you can't think of a question then it puts a lot of suspicion on you for one and if there's particular people that are already nervous about a question then it more pressure gets put on them and you don't know whether they're stalling or whether they're just it's kind of like if you're playing a storytelling game and you weren't generally apt at telling stories yeah. you know it's reliant on the people you're playing with yeah but oh is it amazing when you've got a good group yeah. of people yeah correct well that's spyfall next up is mysterium Woo! All right, i think this one's else's right. <laughs> Well, I've played it twice so far. I haven't played as the ghost in Mysterium, so the basic premise for Mysterium is that it's um, reminiscent of Dixit in a way, but it captures everybody's personal thoughts that when they're playing Dixit, you think in your head by making it a cooperative game. So everyone in it is cooperating. So there is a ghost which has been haunting this particular mansion for a hundred years. Um, so it's the ghost of a, a, of something, um, someone was murdered there. Uh, everyone else plays a psychic and the ghost is trying to get information out to the psychic. So he must try and tell them via their dreams um, who 
who they are. So everybody is a particular person. Uh, everybody is uh, also gets a particular location and a particular weapon. And once everybody has got the location, the weapon, and the person all correct, then the ghost gives out a group dream. Um, and so all the sets are laid out then from all of the potential players. So if there's seven players, one person's the ghost, you've got six other players, you'll lay out the sets from the person, the location, and the weapon. You'll put them all down in a line, and the ghost will give you three clues, and there'll be a clue about the location, a clue about a person, and a clue about the weapon, and you must pick the correct row collectively as a group of where that goes. Um, and the really good part about it is, like I was saying, you get to hear everyone's inner thoughts because everything's collective. So one person that can't talk is the ghost. So the ghost will give a clue for everyone. So initially it is trying to figure out what person each one is. So if there's six players, I think there's like eight cards laid out or eight potential people and they've got a picture of a person, maybe something else, like if it's a barber, there's some scissors, maybe a comb, there's a barber building in the background and a couple of different things. And then if the clue cards are given out or the dreams that you get given, you put it down face up and everyone can help you with that. So ultimately you choose, you put your token on a character that you think it is, but everyone's going to be like, oh, look at this though, that's got this in it or it's got a particular, it's got a sharp thing in there it could be this guy up here there's a vagrant looking guy it could be him oh it looks like the sharp thing it might be the colonel that's in this and it's um just hearing everybody's thoughts that are usually kept a secret in these type of games um it's just excellent to listen to and from what i hear very enjoyable to be the ghost as well it sounds magical it does it's well, it sounds it, really it, different it really is it is very different but it's 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 just taken the uh, like the Dixit idea to that yeah. next step so you're trying to be subtle in Dixit but you don't get to hear what everyone's thoughts are so it's other yeah. games like um, Letters from Whitechapel as well so you get to hear everyone's thoughts when they're all sitting there and Jack so it's that sort of idea but it's done in a more surreal more creative um, way rather than a yeah, sort of but planning way it's more creative than that I suppose yeah. And the, the ghost is trying to help. So the ghost wants everyone to do it. So the yeah. ghost will give... Um, it'll be like, okay, so this is... It's up to Christoph's turn. Christoph is up to the location. And the ghost will have a whole heap of cards to choose. So like seven cards, I think, it wants to choose from. And then the ghost could give Christoph uh, any number of cards to help with a clue. So if you give too many, it's probably going to be too confusing. Uh, usually it's one, some up to three... Uh, roughly about that one sort of sometimes and you look at it and there's there's going to be a big icon in it and there's lots of little things and then sometimes it's a specific color and you get a feel for a location um and yeah so the ghost just listens to everything and shakes their head and tries again <laughs> so you've got um i think you've got seven days to to complete it so it'll be like okay and you've got to guess these three things so first of all everyone gets a clue about the person they put their token on the right one and then the ghost will reveal who's correct uh, then the people cards, they get removed um, from there and it narrows it down a bit and those particular people that got it correct will move on to the location. But still, everybody all working together, everyone's involved and um, yeah, it can be really, really interesting because a, a lot of the cards, as you can imagine, have got items and implements that reflect items and implements from all of the cards. It sounds, it sounds really cool. It sounds. I know. Yeah. It sounds like a really niche game that would fill sort of, you know, a space, especially because it's got like two to seven players and it's best with four players. So it's good for larger numbers than just, you know, I must have three to four players. It's you two know? to seven. Two yes. to well, seven. We, yeah. we broke it essentially by playing with eight. Um, <laughs> it does take a bit longer, but th there was an extra person and it's like, well, it doesn't specifically say seven and that's fine. So we sort of modified it a bit and got the eighth person in it probably took a bit longer I think our game was probably two and a half hours and there wasn't any moment in that where I was looking at my watch or, or anything like that until the, the very end and I'm like you know we just spent this long not caring about time <laughs> being completely absorbed in this game it's, it's definitely a, a gem and it, I didn't realise as much until I'd played it just how good it is sounds good yeah definitely want to check mm. that one out alright mm. next one Summoner Wars Alliances oh god Aos <laughs> Aos Aos. Aos again, I think. All right, all right. I, I've just got one quick point here about Summoner Wars. Um, all right, for you for you who don't know what Summoner Wars is, it's a two-player or four-player, mostly a two-player game, competitive card game where you're playing a set deck of cards from a certain faction against another player, and your cards move along the board as if they were like chess pieces. So it's got a, a area control, not area control, but movement mechanic along with that combat. Very, very tactical sort of game, rather very than tactical, long strategy yeah. game. 
and each of the species that you have have their own special abilities and they're very different and each of them are very overpowered like you sort of look at yours and you're like oh my god I'm gonna beat them it's gonna be great and then you look at theirs and you're like ah well maybe (laughs) it's a very accessible two player strategy card game Right. Mm. Expandable as well. And that's exactly what the Alliances set is. It's a new master set, so it's a new starter set of sorts for the game. It comes with a bunch of factions, but these are hybrid factions of previous Ooh. factions in the game. And that's what makes it interesting. And <gasps> a little bit of a moment here for me to squee about something. It has a new neoprene mat. <laughs> it doesn't have what? a heavy cardboard mat. It has folding out neoprene mats. Which ah, oh, it's amazing. You know what I mean? Like a play mat. Yeah, yeah. proper yeah. play mat. Board. Yeah, it's a board. and that is just the best. It's a, it's perfect. It's perfect. Mm. The game needs it. Yeah, I just well. want to add that it does depend on dice rolls, which some people like and some people don't, but it is very good. It does even out, usually. You can play a game where you roll nothing but ones and never hit anything, and that's pretty bad. Yeah. But... It all it all balances out in the, this grand scheme of things, and there are always factions that like sort of ruin that um, dice roll mechanic where they always hit, or but they take other penalties elsewhere. It is a very well designed tight game. Um, if you want to see more about this, you should check out our review at the Dice Tower. Uh, just board game nights, Summoner Wars. We I think we cover it pretty well there. But yeah, the Alliance did, Master yeah. Set looks really really cool. Mm. So I'm just. Trying to contain my excitement about this. Summon Wars is my favorite game. So, so very good. It is very accessible. You just go in, you buy a faction. There's no power creep. You can buy any one of the uh, faction decks and play against somebody else. And it's, it's pretty basic. So the game itself is basic and straightforward. It's quite tactical. Positioning matters. So you can block people off. In, in some way, it's chess-like in that way. But the combos and abilities adds quite a bit of theme, uh, really. But everything mm. works so well together. I like to explain it as Magic the Gathering meets chess. But it doesn't have that horrible collectible nature of something like Magic where everything's set. You can buy a pack, everyone's got the same things, it's not special. You can spend you know, not very little money relatively and have every single card for the game or you can just buy one of the master sets and you have a very playable set from the very beginning. Yeah, you've still got a big range of variability but um, the uh, alliance is set coming out it makes a hybrid of all these other factions so much more deck building in it each faction has got some special rules too which change it up so if you know the base summoner wars definitely check this one out because it, it certainly changes up a lot of the general rules each faction will have a specific idea about it that um mixes it up the cool the coolest thing about that new um, alliances box though is that apparently it can fit every card for the game it can but you've got to take the mats out in a way okay well that's fine so that's fine. okay that's fine i'll be making my super special custom bulletproof <laughs> titanium summon ore set that holds everything and then they'll release more which i'll be so happy about uh, you'll buy them but it won't fit i will, I will buy it, it. you're you are plaid hats number one customer for that yes i absolutely loving it bring back the dice uh, yeah, I guess move along to another one that is sort of a, an expansion to a game that we all love. There is the o- Order and Chaos expansion, which is coming out for Netrunner. Yep, yes. Android Netrunner's next big box. Yes. I, I got my copy shipped today. It just uh. shipped today. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be one of the first people in Australia with a copy. Oh. Challenge accepted, Christoph. <laughs> Challenge accepted. No joke. I, I, mine, mine left with FedEx International Priority today, so I will have it in about four days. Nice. So before this podcast drops. Probably. I will I will open it up and look at all of the glory. And by the way, I already know what all the cards are in there because they've been spoiled online. And yeah. they've changed names of some so, of them too. So crazy stuff. So those who aren't familiar with Netrunner, Netrunner is a two-player um, living card game where one player plays as a hacker and the other player plays as a corporation with secret agendas that they have to try and score while the hacker is trying to break into those servers and try and steal that information and score points. And it's a, it's a, it's a really tight, well-designed game um, it's qu- it's quite mathematical in a lot of the aspects of it all, but it's um, it's all about tempo. It's all about um, the long game. Like a lot of ga- uh, games like Magic, they usually have a, a sort of a race st- style to them, where you're just trying to beat the other one down first before the other one does. Whereas I feel like Netrunner is more of a like s- slow dance, where you can lose the short game but win the long game. I- yeah, I- you there can is really a m- yeah. There's a massive amount of area for personality as well of the deck building. Mm. You can yes. do whatever you like, basically. There's a very good influence system, so it's not you know 
unre- unrestrained at all. You don't have to stick to one faction. You can spread out to other factions and use other factions' abilities. But it is an asymmetrical game, so you feel like when you're playing as a corporation is very different to playing as a runner. Sometimes you'd take a break of one to go to the other. It's effectively but- two games in one. Yeah, yeah. No, it's pretty good. There's a uh, the third big box expansion gives two factions, um, Wayland and Anarch, which haven't received a lot of love in the past, a whole new suite of tools that it, that really changed the game up, and uh, I think we're all looking forward to that one. Super psyched! My copy's on the way. I want yeah. Argus Security. It looks awesome. Yeah, and and I want I want to play the Monty Python reference. Yeah. I've had worse. <laughs> I've had worse. <laughs> I've had worse. Yeah. Okay, I think right. that's enough fangirling from us. <laughs> <All right. Sorry>. um, <laughs> it's my favorite game. Uh, and our our final one on this particular list of games we're looking forward to, just because this one has popped out of nowhere and it's just blown completely out of anyone's yeah. expectations. We're talking about Exploding Kittens. If you don't know what Exploding Kittens is by t- by the title, it's by the creator of the Oatmeal, the online comic. Well, it's actually created by Ellen Lee, but uh, the guy that does the oatmeal mm-hmm. is doing all the artwork for it. So it's that sort of silly cartoony nonsense that we're pretty familiar with if you know anything about the oatmeal. And I am currently looking at the moment of doing this podcast. It is currently at $4 million. Of a $10,000 goal. <laughs> and, it, and it has 23 days to go. It has 104,000 backers. And Isn't I'm tempted that to buy ludicrous? a copy. <laughs> uh, so it, it seems like just a very simple sort of Russian roulette style with, um, you know, just passing the buck and diffusing bombs and just, like, dealing with each other. It looks like a nice, simple sort of game, but, I mean, the game itself doesn't look anything unique or It's fantastic. incredibly simple. It's incredibly simple. It's, I just think it's, it's like it's, Snap. Yeah, I think it's a... Re- well, I don't think it's quite that bad, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it's bad. Like, it's, right, it so does it's, have, like, Snap. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it looks like a simple game, but I think it's just really interesting to see this as, like, a, a cultural shift that now, you yes. know, just a, a guy that does comics and gets funding for, you know, supporting a Tesla museum and does all these, like, cool little side projects, decides to make a board game and it just takes off. I think it's this, a this is a sign that you know things have changed a little bit. We board yeah, games are this becoming is, this is cool and fashionable again. Maybe, maybe th- this is, maybe <laughs> no, th- this is a this is a bleeding of one cultural th- cultural phenomenon into another, and it's very interesting to see. And the fact that it's coming out of something like Kickstarter is all the more interesting because this is probably the most uh, highly funded game that Kickstarter has seen, right? For a little card game. Yeah, it was the second most, and now I think it's the highest. Well, here here's a little picture on the Kickstarter, right? It says 100 percent funded in 20 minutes. <laughs> one one 1,000% 1, funded in less than an hour. <laughs> Thank you, backers. Yeah. And there's a picture of a cat on a flaming earth. I think this also reflects... It, like, it's a pretty basic game. It's also... Everyone knows... Well, a lot of people do know about the oatmeal. It sort of re- represents sort of... People do want to get into board gaming and things like that. And, you know, that's why I think things like Munchkin... <laughs> Munchkin and Catan always sell well because they are entry level games. And so thankfully, they move on from those. And everyone yes. knows how to play those games, which, which <laughs> yes. is yes. gets along. So if there's just something that gets people to try new games, and, and uh, you know, it's it's the entry level. It's the one thing that makes people go, maybe I'll try something a bit more. Just just yeah. for the numbers, um, Exploding Kittens right now stands at number seventeen in the most uh, funded um, uh, crowdfunding projects at four million. Uh, that's for everything. That's for everything, yes. It is the highest funded card or board game. Uh, and so it's competing mm. with huge video games that were really popular or that, you know, Incredible. everyone's looking forward to, like Elite Dangerous and Star Citizen, these big games that everyone's like, oh, yeah. It's, um, it's just, it's, it's at about half of what Ouya got when they came out with their new console. So we're looking <laughs> at, you know, very well funded game for just Ooh, what yeah. is essentially just a, a deck of cards. Oh, I'm going to say, right, um, it has 104,000 backers, right, currently. Uh, yep. It's probably grown by now. Uh, but you got to think that the majority of that is coming from the Oatmeal's audience. You've got oh, to yeah. imagine. Yeah. Like well, the, the Oatmeal has a massive audience. So putting up, oh, here's a card game. And it's sort of like Cards Against Humanity, how that spiraled into massive popularity as of late, where it's a, a weird game, easy, collectible, mm. and all of a sudden people have just grabbed onto it and it's gone viral it sort of reminds me of we ha- i have i don't know what if you guys read a lot of comics but i've what i read questionable content and one time he posted this link to his band and he was trying to get his band started and it was this link at the bottom of the comic and it was funded in less than a day and mm-hmm. some and it was only this very very small link and i think the connecting it to someone makes it important and i think that's sort of what he's done it's, it's the harnessing of social media right yeah and 
for a board game or like a Patreon or a Kickstarter to harness that audience, this is a wonderful example of that just exploding. But oh, just imagine if you could harness that sort of audience for you know something a bit more in depth. <laughs> I mean, ex- ex- exploding, exploding, exploding kittens looks nice and all, but it's yeah. it's a very simple game, right? Well, uh, it's, it's exactly what it needs to be, right? It needs to be a game yeah. that people look at and they can get. Because, I mean, what's the point of having all these fantastic board games if no one's really interested in learning them? You need to have something mm. that everyone can grasp. It's something a little bit fun and unique uh, that they can bring out and have a good time with it. And I think that this is, exactly what, yeah. what, this is exactly what it is. I think it'll get a whole pile of people that are interested in comics maybe going into board gaming. And I think, like, we've got, we've got these, this huge nerd culture, like, trying to bring everything back and trying to bring it all into the focus. And, we, and you know... This sort of stuff is just the, the first step, right? Everything, we have the nerd culture start to come uh, in and bring in the board games, and then it starts to get into mainstream with things like tabletop. And, uh, I mean, it's just, it's just going to help I- improve the hobby as a whole because, you know, more players is always better, right? Mm, I hate mm. that term, nerd culture. I know, but it, it, there's no other word for it, is there? <laughs> oh, it's, it sounds like out of the basements and D&D and into the world, you know? Well, yeah, yeah. it's still accurate. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it, yeah. I don't know. It just doesn't sound right to me. A lot of the time, that's okay. it is. All right, let's have a, let's have a little <laughs> bit of fun here. All right, uh, let's let's have a challenge. What? We haven't been having fun. No, yet? no fun allowed. <laughs> um, let's have a game. How much do you, does everyone think Exploding Kittens will get by the end of its Kickstarter? Ooh, oh. it's got, all right, it's been up for how long? Seven it's been days. Up for uh, I think seven days. Yes. I'm going to take a guess at. I'm going to say 8 million. So Christoph says 8 million. Jess, what do you think? Uh, I reckon it's probably going to plateau around 6. All right. Uh, Aos, what do you reckon? Yeah, it's a tough call. I'll go with 10. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I reckon probably about 11 million. Because these things, they, 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 they compound on each other, right? I- I've got a feeling like it could also potentially peter out now. That's the fact what that thinking. it's gotten so high and now was, there's the price. It was 3 price. million like yesterday. <laughs> and now it's four million. Yes, so yes, it's certainly a slowing day. down a lot. Okay, well, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, all, let's all take a moment to take a deep breath, all right, everyone? Thank you. And now imagine there is a card game about exploding kittens that, in less than a week, has generated four million dollars <laughs> <laughs> when it only required ten thousand. Yeah. yeah. Just let that sink in. Yeah. But on the other hand, everything is. It's very cheap. I just watched it jump. Yeah. <laughs> it, it just jumped it's like $10. Uh, well, so I changed well, mine. I changed mine to $10 million. <laughs> You can't do that. You can't do that. No, hey, hey, hey. Get off my beard. Six, 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 six will be six, the number. Six. six. Okay. All right. Uh, and we will come back in three weeks' time and see who's correct. And, and then we'll laugh at everyone else for being wrong. And see who, who claims bragging rights. Just for yes. a fact, um, I'm not one of the backers. <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> Yet. Until yes. it gets close to your Number right? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Seven million nine hundred and. <laughs> oh, there's no, there's no prizes. <laughs> there's no prizes for getting it right. Honor is a prize. No, but it's it's very interesting just to see it. It's insane. That's all, folks. That wraps up the board game nights podcast of Game Lot. So if you wouldn't mind, leave a comment. Google us, uh, Google the Board Game Nights, look for us on Facebook, find us, annoy us, ask us questions, leave some feedback, invite some friends, do all of those crazy things. And until next time, I'm Aos James. I'm Christoph Schrader. I'm Sam Gillespie. And I'm Jessica James. So long. <laughs> Good night, Tiger. <laughs> That's a scream. No, it's scary. <laughs> Good. Don't like That'll it. Do. I, think you could, I think you should leave it in that scream. I don't no, want to do total, it. Total, total, totally leaving it there. <laughs>